everyone, it's Cass. Welcome back to my channel, What Cass Read. Today, I'm gonna finally bring to you my series review for The Great Coat series written by Sebastian de Castell. So The Great Coat series is a series of four books written by Sebastian de Castell, and those four books include book number one, which is called Traitor's Blade, book number two, which is called Night's Shadow, book number three is called Saint's Blood, and the fourth and final book is called Tyrant's Throne. The Great Coat series starts off with Traitor's Blade. The Great Coats are a group of traveling magistrates who were appointed by the king, and our main character, Falcio, is the first cantor of the Great Coats. He was appointed by the king, and the traveling magistrates go throughout the kingdom and dispense the king's justice. They listen to cases, they hear what grievances people throughout the kingdom may have, and they dispense the king's law. They will dispense the king's law through song, um, but sometimes the rules need to be upheld and they might also have to duel. They're all very well accomplished duelists. Before the beginning of the story, the dukes of the realm plotted together to overthrow the king and put the great coats out of power because they wanted to seek the power for themselves. And so before the story begins, they end up killing the king. The great coats have been displaced from their seats of power, uh, but not before the king has tasked each of the great coats with a secret mission and they were dispersed throughout the kingdom. Each great coat, they do not know the mission that the king has set forth for each of them. It's all secret even amongst each other. And our main character, Falcio, has been tasked with finding the king's sherwats or the king's jewels. And he travels throughout the kingdom with his two best friends, Kest Morrelson and Brasty Goodbow. Every day they're trying to find and uncover clues to perhaps what did the king mean by this? It has been about five years since the king was put out of power and they're just trying to figure out what exactly the king's last words may have meant to them. So as each book progresses, we have the main mission of finding the king's jewels, finding the king's sherowettes, uncovering what each great coat secret mission was, but each different book also has its own little subplot, its own little journey. So the little journey, the little subplot that they end up encountering in Traitor's Blade is there is a young girl that uh, Falcio, our main character, ends up rescuing, and she doesn't seem to be all that important, but there are a lot of important people who want her dead. So he spends the first book trying to protect this young girl while also trying to fulfill his mission to the king. In Night Shadow, we start off the book where Falcio has been dealing with a poison. He's been dealt this death blow, pretty much, and it's this latent poison that works its way through his system, and he is desperately trying to find a cure for himself. His his friends are vastly worried for him. At times it puts him in a state of paralysis and they're just not entirely sure what to do. A lot of the main villains are still after them in this book and there are these black tabarded knights, these black knights that are sweeping their way through the kingdom and they end up trying to kill several prominent uh, ducal families and the ducal families have decided to enlist the power of Falcio and his friends to see if they can't find out who is at the bottom of these murders and who these black tabarded knights are. For book number three, Saint's Blood, there is this mysterious evil presence that has crept throughout the land. The saints of Tristia have now been targeted and are being killed off like flies and people are really worried because how do you kill a saint? Who is this person that is targeting the saints? And not only have they been targeting them, but they have been exacting a very unique form of torture for the saints by encasing all of the saints in this iron mask that ends up essentially wiping their powers out. So the people that are extremely close to Falcio and his friends, um, they end up having to figure out who is behind this, what does this have to do with um, the war that has been going on throughout the kingdom since there's been a lot of unrest with the ducal families um, from the previous book. And then that final book, like I said, is Tyrant's Throne. So this is all of the action that we have been uh, building up to with these black tabarded tabarded knights, um, with the ducal families being put out of power and some of them have been killed, with these saints who have been destroyed, um, with this iron mask and some of them perhaps have survived. The land of Tristia is in a ton of unrest because now there's a power vacuum and who is trying to fill that power vacuum? We have 
a lot of great relationships that come to a head in this book. We have a lot of um, conflicts that come to a head and I felt like this conclusion really resolved so many different things and not necessarily in the way that you might think. Has Falchio ended up succeeding in his final mission to the king? Have his friends also fulfilled their quests? Um, like I said, this concludes in such a wonderful way, but not necessarily in the happiest way that you might hope for, not necessarily in the obvious way that you might hope for, and I thought this was such a great conclusion. So next I want to talk about the world building. I enjoyed the world building for this so much because as we start on the first book, Traitor's Blade, there's a really complete picture of Tristia, the state of uh, how the Great Coats are in. I mean, they're pretty much put out of power and we really only know Kest, Brasti, and Falchio um, and the kinds of characters that we meet along the way. But as each story progresses, like I said, with each different subplot, while we're still trying to discover the King Sherowats and uncover any hidden Great Coats that might still be out there, we get more and more information where now in the second book, we get information from the Ducal family. Now, in the third book, we get information from the saints of different religious orders. And then at the final uh, book, we have all of these moving pieces. The world of Tristia, we have the Great Coats, which are called the Tratari in um, some of the ancient orders. But then we have an ancient order of religious knights. We have the Bardati, which is this ancient order of minstrels. We have the Dishini, which is an ancient order of assassins, and how all of these ancient orders have kept their faiths alive throughout the ages um, with the rise and fall of men and the rise and fall of kings because there's all sorts of different political agendas that may come up. And I thought that was a really rich piece. Now I will say, if you're not a fan of blow by blow action, this may not be the series for you. Because Sebastian de Castell, the writer and the author, he is um, a swordsman himself. I, I, I don't want to mix him up with some other authors because I know there's a lot of authors that I follow who also participate in a lot of medieval swordplay. But I do know that Sebastian de Castell is a fencer. And so a lot of the fencing terminology does find its way into this series. And because he is a fencer and because he has so much um, inside knowledge of what it's like to be in these fencing situations and these dueling situations and what may be a strategy and what may be something that can impede a character's advancement in a duel, he has all of that knowledge. So when I tell you it is like a blow by blow of action, I completely mean it is a blow by blow of action. But on the other side of that, if you are someone who likes a lot of action sequences, you're not gonna be disappointed in this series at all because of how much attention to detail is put into all of these action sequences. And it's not just dueling. There's just so many different fight scenes that our characters find themselves in. And like, honestly, you can visualize the kinds of fight scenes that our characters wind up in. And um, there's also magic throughout the story, but our main characters, our great coats, are not necessarily magic users. That's also something that I really appreciated because our characters weren't necessarily the ones um, who had all the power and they weren't the ones who had all of the knowledge to begin with. So for other magic users to find their way in and out of Falchio's life, um, had a great impact on the story, has a great impact on him as a character, but he's not necessarily the one wielding the magic. So if you're also someone who's a little bit tired of reading first person magic perspectives and want something a little bit different, like how does the impact affect just your regular everyday people who are not magic users, this could also be a good story for you. And then finally, this series is called The Great Coat Series. These are specially made leather coats that have bone plates in them so they can use them like armor but they're supremely lightweight for the nature of the duels that they may get in and that the battles that they may face but the bone plates end up protecting them and there's also a ton of pockets like if you're someone who is a really big fan of um Kel in A Darker Shade of Magic. If you're a fan of his coat, you will definitely be a fan of the great coats um, because they have all sorts of salves and potions and extra weapons inside of their great coats and how they use them in battle is vastly, is so incredibly unique. I have not really encountered much of this probably since The Three Musketeers and that's why it's a really great comparison to make between this and The Three Musketeers. When I made my 2018 book awards video, I really should have put like favorite fictional article of clothing because it would definitely be a great coat. I want all the great coats now. 
I think it's like the coolest thing. Like I don't think armor is worth anything anymore after hearing the great coats and Falcio and Keston Brasti talk about just the uses that their great coats have served them. I love them. Reading this series and then also reading A Darker Shade of Magic, now I've become obsessed with like magical coats um, or characters with like really awesome, amazing coats. All right, so let's talk about the characters. Like I've said, our main character is Falcio Valmond. He is the first cantor of the great coats and we meet him kind of smack dab in the middle of his relationship with his two best friends, Kes Marlson and Brasty Goodbow. They're all three men from different walks of life, but Falcio and Kes Marlson did grow up together. Falcio is a really, like at times he's complex, but at times he's also supremely thick headed. And because we're inside his head, there were plenty of eye, worth, eye rolling worthy moments where I was like, oh my God, not again. But at the same time, the writing was done so well in that Sebastian de Castell purposefully placed characters inside the narrative to call Falcio out on his like pig-headed and stupidness. He's so grandiose in his thinking and he's so loyal to a fault to this dead king, King Palis. He's loyal to a fault to his dead um, family members that he just sometimes can only see things in black and white and there are plenty of people in his life that are there to call him out on it. And I felt like just as I would get sick of him going off on like a little soliloquy, cause he had several of those, there was always a character in there to break some of the tension or to make, Cal make Falcio rethink his motives and his strategy. And it was awesome. He's our flawed main character. He's extremely flawed, but he's really righteous and he wants to do the right thing. It's just like so painfully good, but also like so painfully like in his own head. But the writing is very self-aware of that fact. And that's why I didn't really get sick of him. Then we have Kes Morrison, who is Falcio's best friend from, gro from when they were children. And Kes Marlson is the best swordsman in all of the land. He's very thoughtful. He consistently tries to think at least two or three or 12 steps ahead of everybody um, because he's trying to analyze what is happening. So that way he can anticipate movements. That way he can anticipate um, some of the outcomes of the um, high stakes uh, adventures and pickles that they might get themselves into. He's very self-assured in his sword play. He's very self-assured in his leader of Falcio. And he knows what his skills are and he knows what he is capable of and what he is not capable of. Um, so he comes in really great handy that way, but he's also one of the voices of reason for Falcio. Then we have Brasty Goodbow, who is the comedic relief for a lot of, a lot of the action that they may get themselves into. And, um, for a while, you think that's like all the value that he can bring to the group. And I think for a while, he just kind of puts up with it because everybody else thinks the same of him. And everybody's like, how did he wind up a great coat? How did he wind up best friends with two of the greatest fighters in the land? And I think that kind of comes into play like in his head a little bit where he's trying to prove to them that he means business, but he doesn't always want them to know. Brasti is full of humor, but again, I think it's just something that Sebastian de Castell was very self-aware of as he was writing these pieces. Um, there's a few other characters that we encounter. There are some really great female characters. We have Athalia, who um, at first when they meet her, we're not really sure if she's a whore or not. She does. Um, sometimes call herself that, but sometimes she doesn't. Um, there's our young girl that we were trying to rescue from all these people who wanted dead. Her name is Aline. And then we also have flashbacks that are told um, from Falcio's perspective. So we get a lot of really great backstory on King Palis and the relationship that he had with King Palis. We have an amazing villain um, that I mentioned in my best of 2018 video, and that is Duke Gillard, the Duke of Riju, and he's an extremely powerful man, and he was probably the most powerful man in the kingdom aside from the king, and then when the king was put out of power, when the king was killed, then he rose uh, very high, very fast. Um, and there was just a lot of really great back and forth banter between Falcio and Duke Gillard, and that was one of my favorite relationships to see play out throughout the whole series. And then we did have another really great female character named Valiana. We meet her in the first book. She's a young woman who ends up traveling with Falcio and the other two great coats. Um, she's trying to make her way across the realm because she's trying to 
broker peace between two separate ducal entities, uh, but she is someone that they meet early on and she has a lot of really great roles to play as the series progresses, so I couldn't get enough of Valiana either. And like I said, we meet the religious orders, we meet the Bardati minstrels, we meet the Dishini assassins, like there's so many different layers to this uh, story and how they intersect with our characters as well. This story does have some content warnings for sexual assault, we do have uh, pretty graphic torture scenes um, and violence, as well as some animal abuse. If those are things that do not work for you, they're very heavily used in the first two books. That's where a lot of, uh, where some of the most horrific things that we read for these characters um, happens is the first two books. It tapers off toward the end and I'm not sure if that was something like maybe Maybe the author felt he put his characters through enough and just didn't want to continue on with that sort of writing as the series progressed. Um, so it worked kind of in reverse order because I've read some series where the first book is, is less gratuitous in its violence and then as it ramps up with the action ramping up then we get more and more violence uh, toward our characters. But this one starts off um, not necessarily so much in the first book, but it is there. It's pretty heavy in the second book, and then it tapers off again. So my thoughts on the series as a whole, um, I did not rank them the same across the board. Trader's Blade, I did give five out of five stars to. Night's Shadow, I gave five out of five stars to. When we get to Saint's Blood, this was the only one that I had some misgivings about where was this book going as far as the whole series projection, so I did give that four out of five stars. But then the conclusion with Tyrant's Throne picked right back up. It was one of the best finales that I read this year. Um, I did give that five out of five stars as well. So really solid ratings across the board for each of the books. Again, they each had something different to bring to the table. I'm really happy that I ended up reading this whole series. If I hadn't listened to it on audiobook, I just don't know when I would have gotten to it. But I'm telling you, Joe Jameson as an audiobook narrator um, is really fantastic. So if you're looking for a new fantasy audiobook, again, I'm going to recommend this series as well. So please put some comments in the comment section below. Let me know what you think about this series if you've read it. I'm not going to do a spoiler video, so if you do have spoilers that you want to say, go ahead and like warn people if you're going to write a comment that has spoilers in it. But it was just something that was so great that I read this past year and I'm really sad that I don't have any more books to look forward to. So find me on Instagram and Twitter if you want to talk about any of the series that I'm currently reading or that I have read. That's at WhatCastRead. It's the same as this channel so it should be super easy to find. And then you can also find me on Goodreads. That link is always listed down below. Otherwise, you know how these videos end. I will talk to you later. Bye.